This morning, we're going to be skipping all over Scripture. So I would encourage you, if you're able to, all of the Scriptures that we're going to look at this morning uh, are of note. I would make sure, if you're able to, if you're not able to get to them, most of them will be up here on the screen. Uh, but many uh, verses, I would encourage you, write down these references. These would be good, uh, good reference points for you to go back to. Because this morning, we're going to talk about some universal truths. Universal truth. This is going to be a little bit different of a Sunday school lesson. I'm going to build a case to you, okay? And I, I'm aware of who my audience is, okay? I'm aware that you're the Sunday school crowd. So I, I have that in mind. I've had that in mind as I was preparing. We're going somewhere as we go. So <clears throat> as you hear and you think, boy, I, I know this. Hold that thought because we're going somewhere. We're building a case. As humans... We're constantly dividing ourselves into groups, aren't we? We're, we're all humans, but we divide ourselves uh, as from the north, from the south, from the midwest, from the east coast, from the west coast. There's political differentiations. There's Republican, Democrat, Independent, Green Party, and then you can go into all of these little splinter cell parties. There's conservative, liberal, libertarian. There are some who would claim to be anarchist. Okay? There's all sorts of... of uh, divisions. There's people who drive Fords. There's people who drive Chevy. There are people who drive GMC. There's people who drive Dodge. There's foreign make people. We divide ourselves. I remember when I was really little, before I could drive, I used to pick on, we, I came from a family when we lived down in North Carolina. My family always drove Fords. And so we would pick on our youth pastor when I was growing up because he only drove Chevy. So we would give him a hard time, which like I didn't have any business giving anybody a hard time. I didn't have a license, couldn't drive anything, but I like giving him a hard time because the division's kind of uh, kind of fun sometimes, isn't it? We we divide ourselves, and then we can we can talk about the differences. We can talk across the aisle. We can make much of differences, or we can make less of differences. But that's just in America. What I just mentioned, those things that I just mentioned, that's just in the United States. If you expand to the world, how many differences do we have? <laughs> Infinite, right? There are so many differences. It would be impossible to enumerate all of them. So many different subgroups that divide all of mankind. But as much as we like to divide into and identify ourselves by our convictions, our standards, our preferences, our, our race, our language, our whatever it is, as much as we have those divisions, there are several things that are universally true of all men. And so let me build a case for you because we're going somewhere. At the end of this, I've got something that you and I need to do, and I'm going to share that with you. But let's start. The first universal truth is... Death is certain for all men. Doesn't matter which continent you were born on. Doesn't matter your skin color. Doesn't matter your religion. Doesn't matter anything. You can drive a Ford. You can drive a Chevy. You can drive a Fiat. Whatever it is, death is sure. Men have said an awful lot about death over the years. Let me give you a couple quotes. This man's name, Edward Monk. Looks like Munch, but it's pronounced Monk. He was an artist. If I was to show you some of his pictures, you'd recognize them. If you've ever seen the picture Scream, uh, kind of an impressionist painting of somebody doing this with lots of colors in the back, you would notice it if I, if I showed it to you. He said, from my rotting body, flowers shall grow, and I am in them. That is eternity. What do you think? Huh? Oh. No, that, boy, that would be a rough eternity, right? Because flowers die, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Number two, somebody from long past, Epicurus, said, It is possible to provide security against other ills, but as far as death is concerned, we men live in a city without walls. What does he mean by that? He means there's absolutely nothing. You can prepare for unemployment. You can take out insurance against fire, but death is going to happen. There's nothing you can do to hold it off. Eventually, death's going to get all of us. Marlena Dietrich, she was an actress of years gone by. Many people have said this, but she's quoted as having said it. She said, when you're dead, you're dead. That's it. 
Again, I've heard lots of people say this. I could attribute the quote, but she was recorded as having said it publicly. When you're dead, you're dead. That's it. What do you think? You've heard it. She missed it. You're right. Another one. This, the source of this one kind of surprised me. Pope Paul VI said, Somebody should tell us right at the start of our lives that we're dying. Then we might live to the limit. Every minute of every day. Do it, I say. Whatever you want to do, do it now. There are only so many tomorrows. Pope Paul VI. He was the Pope from 1897 to 1978. So, kind of an interesting thought. Or he lived during that period of time. Wasn't the Pope for that whole time. Mankind has always known that death is certain. It's sure to come to those who are rich and famous. It comes to the poor and the unknown. Death is the universal statistic, isn't it? It will, 100% of all men born of woman will die. The overriding philosophy of those without God has been, and you've probably heard similar philosophies to this, life is short, so grab all the gusto you can get. That's been the prevailing theory all the way back in Luke chapter 12, verse 19. You remember, we looked at this when we went through Luke 12. There was the rich fool. He said, I've laid up all these goods. Eat, drink, and be merry. Be merry. That's, that's man's philosophy, isn't it? Man's philosophy is life is short. Death is certain. Live it up. Grab all the gusto you can get. God also says much about death. He says in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, he says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. Before Adam sinned, no death. Think of it. Think of it. No death. Everyone just lived. Everything just lived. Okay? But by death came sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Death is a direct result. Of the sin of man. God told Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. You remember he said, you may eat of all the trees of the garden. You may do whatever except, and he gave them how many rules? One, one. one rule. One rule is all he gave them. He said in Genesis 2 verse 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely Die. Okay, now, talk with me. We're in Sunday school. Talk with me here. Eve saw the fruit, tempted by the, tempted by the serpent. She took it. She saw that it was good to eat, fair to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took a bite and fell over dead. No. No, no. She gave it to her husband, and he did eat. Took a bite, and he fell over dead. No, no. Then what are we talking about? If God says, in the day that ye eat thereof, thou shalt surely die, and they ate of it, then we must be talking about something more than just physical death. Okay? Because Adam lived 900 and some years. Okay? So God wasn't saying, if you take the bite... Your heart will stop beating, your lungs will stop working, your brain will short out, and you'll hit the floor. That's not what God meant. God was talking about spiritual death. Now, as a result of Adam's sin, what did eventually happen? As I mentioned, he lived 960 years. Eventually, he did die. Eventually, physical death, the moment Adam took a bite, physical death started. Because... Some, I've, I've heard it said jokingly that good health is just the slowest possible rate at which you can die, right? There's, there's some truth to that, okay? That's what was going on. Adam, as soon as he ate, as soon as he disobeyed, he broke God's law. And the process of death, decay, and decomposition started. Prior to that, Adam had been in a state of suspended perfection. When he ate of the fruit, he began to die. And he was, he was downhill from there. <clears throat> Far from the words of Marlena Dietrich we read earlier when she said, when you're dead, you're dead. That's it. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 9.27 that there's more. The Bible says, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, after this, the judgment. 
not that's it. After this, judgment. Meaning, death is more of a door than a wall. Okay? Death doesn't end. Death is the beginning of either eternal life or eternal death. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. death. The just earnings. Physical death and eternal separation from God in hell. Revelation 20 verse 14 tells us that death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Okay? Now what we've heard about death up to this point. Death is sure. Death is not the end is universally true of all men. And the default setting for all men, and when I say men, I'm using it in the, the, the royal sense, mankind, the default setting for mankind is separation from God. <clears throat> the default setting is those who die all have sinned. The wages of sin is yeah. death. So the default setting for all men is eternal separation from God in hell. That's the default setting. Yeah. But God provided a way <clears throat> that Christians can avoid death. Romans 6.23, you know this well, says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The first part of that verse, for the wages of sin is yeah. death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What's, what's the gift? Salvation. Salvation, absolutely. John 3, 16, you know it. For God so loved the world that he gave, gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish or die, but have everlasting life. So, default setting. Everyone who's born will die, and unless drastic remedial action is taken, they'll spend eternity in hell. But God made a way. That they would not have to suffer death. They could instead have eternal life. We'll talk about that more in a moment. <clears throat> First Corinthians 15 verse 22 says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Right? Okay, now if you look in the book of Romans, you'll find that, that Jesus is actually called the second Adam. Okay? The first Adam, how did he do? Not, good. Not great, right? He blew it. One rule, right? We all, we all think, if you're anything like me, I'm, I'm looping you in in my thoughts. I think, okay, I wouldn't have broken that rule. But you know what? I would have. <laughs> Adam was perfectly made. Without the stain of sin. He was made, he was programmed, he was customized by God himself. And he fell to, to one rule. I would have to. Adam was the, the head of the human race. And in Adam all died. Because of Adam's sin, all of us are born in sin thereafter. But in Christ, the second Adam, how did he do? He did beautiful. Perfect. Yeah. He was perfection. He didn't break the law. The Bible says that sin is the breaking of the law. Jesus kept the law at every point. And thus, acceptable in the eyes of God because he is God. And so a way was made. But one day, though I've trusted Jesus as my personal Savior, I've accepted that gift. But one day, unless the Lord returns before it happens, my body, because of sin, okay. will die. Mm -hmm. But God has even removed the, the stinger from the hornet of death. Again, in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, he says, O death... Where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Next week, we're going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What's the significance of Jesus Christ's resurrection when it comes to my death? Because he lives, we shall live also. Right? That's what the Bible says. One day, I'm going to die, and so will you. Unless the Lord comes back, one day... Time will catch up. My body will have decayed to the point where it doesn't work anymore. I'll take my last breath. But that's not the end. But even that, the sting is removed. Why? Because I have what John 3.16 talks about. If, that, that if whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For me, 
Philippians 1.21 says, to live is Christ. To die is gain. Why? Well, because for a believer, death is just a doorway to, to real life. Real life. 2 Corinthians 5, 8 says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I saw uh, somebody had made up kind of a, a, a cartoon type of a thing of two twins in the womb. And they were talking and they were saying to one another, the one was saying, do you think there's life after birth? <laughs> and the other said, no, this is all there is. That's, that's just a, a small picture of what it is for us to say, this is all there is. Now, this is nice. I love the life that God's given me. But there's so much more. Is there life after death? Yes. Yeah. The real question that you could ask is, that life before death, right? That's, of course we have it, but it's going to pale in comparison to what God gives us after death. You think about when, when I close my eyes in death. I've, I've been there when people have closed their eyes at the last. I've watched as they've done it. I watched my grandfather, who knew the Lord. I watched him close his eyes from years and years of pain. And, and it wasn't sad. Now, now, I cried because I missed my grandfather as I watched him pass out of time and into eternity. But I knew that when he closed his eyes here, he opened his eyes on real, true, eternal life. He got to look into the face of Jesus. Amen. And, and it's silly to feel sorry for someone who, who passes into that. Imagine, oh, we wish they were back. They don't. They don't. They're, they're more alive now than they've ever been. Life in Christ. Again, I'm aware of my audience. I know I'm preaching to the choir a little bit here. Number one, universal truth. Death is certain to all men. Number two, all men are looking for God. Now, as soon as I say that, you may be in the back of your mind, you have, a, you have an alarm bell go up and you say, wait a minute, what about Romans 3.11, where it says, there's none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. Okay, you're right. Let me give you another verse to that. Psalm 14, verse 2. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. What these verses are saying, Psalm 14, 2 and 3, and Romans 3, 11, what they're saying is that no man by himself will come to God. It, there, there has to be God's, God's help. Okay? Let, let me give it to you in Scripture. John 6, 44 says, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. You can't get saved by yourself. You have to have the Holy Spirit. Right. That's, that's just a fact. The Bible says so. When I say that all men are looking for God, here's what I mean by that. I mean that all men are looking for the peace and fulfillment that only God can give. Maybe you've heard, heard it said that there's a God-shaped hole in the heart of every man, and only God can fill it. If you go back, I remember... When I was in high school looking at uh, Albert Einstein, the life of Albert Einstein, he invented, uh, came up with the theory of relativity. He was a pretty, pretty sharp guy, right? Uh, he, after he came up with E equals MC squared, he spent much of the end of his life looking for something that he called the universal constant. He was looking for, for what is the principle that holds everything together? Why don't, why don't you tell me? Who is the principle that holds everything together? God. God. He has the whole world, the palm of his hand, right? Who keeps the atoms from falling apart? God. Who keeps the planets from careening out of orbit and slamming into each other? God. Okay? Culture is looking for a universal principle, a universal ethic. Eastern religion is trying to find karma, and some are trying to find nirvana. Where they can become one with the universe. The new age is trying to find that as well. This universal oneness. And when we find that. We, we, found, we found God. And they would say with a lowercase g. We found God. And they have all different names. 
Again, there's that God-shaped hole in the heart of every man, woman, and child. Nothing else can fill it. There's an interesting book I would encourage you if you're interested. Uh, it's called Eternity in Their Hearts. It's by a veteran missionary named Don Richardson. And it documents the traditions of many cultures that point to their belief in the God. Okay? They, they're misguided. They're off track. They're not saved, but they're looking for the one true God. You know this from personal experience. You know this fact from your life, but you also know it from the lives of people who you've dealt with. You know that people try to fill that void within with the pleasures that the world has to offer. They try drugs and alcohol and sex and fame and money and intellectual pursuits. Man is always trying to fill that void within, but nothing will. How much alcohol does it take to fill the hole? That God made. It, you, it doesn't. It'll make you more empty. How, how many partners would, would one have to have in order to get that peace and fulfillment that their heart craves? They'll never get there. Why? Because God made it so that man wouldn't be able to fill that hole with anything but a relationship with him. Proverbs 16.25 says... There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. All of these different things. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Yeah. Death. We're back to that first principle. Death is sure. Death is certain. Mm -hmm. Nothing can fill the black hole man carries except God. The fact that life lacks purpose without the God of creation leads directly to the next principle. Number three. All men come to God the same way. All men come to God the same way. How does man come to God? Through Jesus Christ. Through faith. By grace through faith in Christ. the finished work of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.8. For by grace are ye saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. All men come to God the same way. Well, you say, how about in the Old Testament? How did men come to God? By grace, through faith, in the yet unfinished work of Christ. We look back historically. They looked forward prophetically. They saw one day a Messiah will come. We look back and say a Messiah has. did come or has come. Romans 4 verse 3 says, For what saith the scriptures? Abraham, was Abraham before the cross or after? Before. Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. There it is. What's, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. God's plan has always been the same. To come to him, man must repent of his sin, place his full dependence in the finished work of Christ alone for salvation. There's, not, there's no additional things that you have to do. It's not that plus church membership, plus confirmation, plus baptism. Plus, plus communion, plus tithing, plus anything. It's Christ alone. That's it. So quickly, death is certain. Are you following with me? We're building a case here. Death is certain for all men. Okay? All men are looking for God. Even though they don't know that it's God they're looking for, they would say, I'm, I'm looking for fulfillment. I'm looking for happiness. I'm looking for joy. They're looking for God. They just don't know it. All men come to God the same way. They always have. They always will. Everyone, the Bible says that there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. But who is that? Christ. Jesus Christ. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Okay, so when we're standing, let's, let's fast forward a million years, okay? You'll still be around and I'll still be around, okay? Yeah. okay. Not here. Not, boy, aren't you glad of that? Whew, yeah. Yeah, okay. We'll still be around. We'll be, we'll be gathered around the throne, okay? And we'll be singing the praise of the Lord. And we'll all be able to say, you'll be able to tap on the shoulder of anybody in heaven. You'll say, how'd you get here? And the answer will always be the same. I got here because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that he made for me. He saved me. 
That's what we've got. All men come to God the same way. Yeah. Let me give you number four. Another universal truth about all men. God desires all men to be saved. Yes. Right. All men to be saved. Yeah. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any, that's an absolute word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, this completely contradicts the, the theory that some would hold of election. That God chooses some to be saved, God chooses some to be lost. God would have who to be saved? All. He's not willing that any should perish. There's the answer to that. Let me give you, let me give you some more. Let's, let's make the case. Let's make it as rock solid biblically as we can. Titus 2 verse 11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Romans 10 verse 13, For Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. John 12, verse 32. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men, all men unto me. What do you think of God's heart for, for mankind? Pretty inclusive, isn't it? Now, I mentioned before that the, you can't get saved without the working of the Holy Spirit. Right? Would you agree with that? What's the Holy Spirit's job? Well, he came into the world to convict men of sin, righteousness, and judgment. You can't get saved without the Holy Spirit. So who does the Holy Spirit convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment? All men. All men. All men. You, you, mean, you mean he's not selective? You mean he doesn't convict this person but not that person? Well, according to these verses, I would say he convicts all men because he says... Whosoever will may come. We sing the song sometimes. Whosoever will, whosoever will, send the proclamation over land and hill. You can't give the gospel to the wrong person. Aren't you glad? Amen. There are certain there are certain belief systems that would that would call somebody to pause as they're handing out a tract because they think, I don't know if this person can be saved. You, you remember the Hebrew word for that? Hogwash. Okay? Not true. You hand a gospel tract to anybody on the face of God's green earth, and God will do a work in that person. You can't give the gospel to the wrong person. John chapter 3, verse 16, once again, for God so loved the world. But he really kind of liked America, didn't he? Well, he's given a blessing to America, but he loved the world. Did, did, did God so love Africa and Asia? Oh, yes. yes. And Australia and all the other continents. Now, here's, here's where we're going. Okay? You've got it up to this point. We've gotten, we've gotten these five principles. Death is certain. It comes to all. It, one day, it's going to get you and me too. Why? Because God said so. Because God said so because the wages of sin is death. death. One day, it's going to get you. Number two, all men are looking for God. They don't know it. They might be using some other thing to fill the void. But all men are looking for God. All men come to God the same way. By grace, through faith, in the finished work of Christ alone. Number five, God desires all men to be saved. Number, number, I'm sorry, number five now. We should be pure of the blood of all men. There's where we're going. Here We've arrived at the destination. Let's, let's unpack it just a little bit. We're getting this from a, a, a thing that Paul said to the elders in Ephesus. The Apostle Paul was a widely traveled man. He preached to multiplied thousands over the course of his ministry large groups, and then he also had the epistles that he wrote, and they went, and they were dispersed widely amongst, amongst the churches. The Apostle Paul preached to a great many people, but he also started some churches. And if you read in the book of Acts, it's mostly the story of the beginning of the church, and then Peter, and then it shifts to Paul. And when you get to Acts chapter 20, you come to Paul's, he's coming to a transition in his ministry. He's getting ready to go to Rome. And he knows it. And he knows it's pro 
probably not going to go well. Who was the emperor at this time? Nero. Nero. How did Nero feel about Christians? <laughs> not great. Okay? So Paul knows, I'm going to Rome. Chances are it's not going to go well. So he's, he's kind of making, you could call it a farewell tour almost. <coughs> he, he kind of makes this, this journey and he goes to Ephesus, which was a church that he had spent a great deal of time at. It's the church that he wrote the, the epistle to the Ephesians. Okay? He comes to this church and he's talking with the, the elders and the men of the church. And he says to them in Acts chapter 20, verse 26, he, he makes a startling statement. He says, wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. That's quite a statement, isn't it? <coughs> I'm pure of the blood of all men. And he's willing to take them to record. He says, you're my witness. I haven't, I haven't not shared the gospel with anyone. I've given it to everyone I had opportunity to. Think of it. Th think of that. Now, you, you're probably already, if you are, hold yourself up. It's not wise to compare ourselves amongst ourselves. But it is wise to compare yourself to this book. Okay? So, I want you to hold yourself up to what, <coughs> what was just said here. I'm pure of the blood of all men. What is, what is Paul saying here? Well, I think he's probably hearkening back to one of the prophets. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 7. This is God speaking to Ezekiel, obviously. And he says, o, o, So thou, O son of man... I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. That's the duty of any prophet. They, they talk to the people for God, and they talk to God for the people. And God told Ezekiel, I'm going to tell you something, and it's your responsibility to tell others. Okay? That's the principle. He says, when I say unto the wicked, this is God, he says, when I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. There it is again. Thou shalt surely die if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. What's he talking about? Well, a watchman. What's the duty of a watchman? Be watched. <laughs> to watch. Yeah, that's a pretty low-hanging fruit there, right? <laughs> He's to watch. What's he watching for? A thief. A thief, an invading army. If, if the watchman is sitting there at his post, it's been a long day, and he's kind of tired, and he, he closes his eyes, and then he kind of opens them occasionally. And one of those times he opens them, and there are torches all across the horizon and he sees a dark wave of humanity coming down over the hill what should the watchman probably do <laughs> ring the bell blow the trumpet start screaming do whatever it takes to get the attention of the people in the town so that they can do what defend him. prepare and defend themselves but this watchman he says ah it's okay closes his eyes again what do you think Good watchman? What happens when the town gets overrun and many of the people get massacred? Who actually bears some of the blame for the death of the innocent? The watchman. The watchman. Why? Because he didn't do his job. Because he was watching and then he didn't say anything. He knew. Let me, let me just go ahead and jump ahead. He knew that death is certain. He knows that all men are looking for God. He knows that that all men come to God the same way. He knows that God wants all men to be saved. But he says, oh, it's okay. They'll, they'll figure it out. Good watchman? No. And what happens when, when, the, when the, the after action report is fired, filed? The, the watchman is going to have blood on his hands. The, the same principle is clear. Obviously, you're not Ezekiel and neither am I. Okay, I'm not a watchman to the house of Israel. Ezekiel was. But the principle holds the same. The principle is this. If I know of impending doom, 
and I could warn people, but I choose not to, then I bear at least some of the responsibility. If the bridge is out, you know it's out, you see cars flying down the road, what should you do? Stand out there and stop them. You say, I don't want to look like a fanatic. But bridge is out. People will die. Well, I don't they're talking and I don't want to interrupt them. They're they're having a moment and I what would you call somebody who was standing next to a bridge with a big sign that said bridge is out? Would, would, you, would you be thankful or would you yeah. say, oh, they're just some kind of a nut? <laughs> You'd think, boy, they're, they're probably doing a good job. You'd at least slow down, right? You'd probably stop and say, hey, is the bridge really out? <laughs> yep, it is. Okay. Watchmen. Romans 14 verse 12 tells us that every man shall give account of himself before God. But what if that man doesn't hear about God because I didn't tell him? What's necessary if I want to be like Paul? If I want to be able to say I'm pure from the blood of all men, talk to me. What, what are the necessary steps that I must take? If I'm going to be pure of the blood of all men, I don't want the blood of people who I know who go to hell I don't want their blood on my hands. What does that mean? What do I need to do? Tell them what? I need to give them the gospel, right? Because what's gospel mean? Do you remember? Good news. But it's only good news if it gets there in time, right? If the first time somebody hears the whole gospel of Jesus Christ is after they die and when they're standing before him to be judged, is it good news? No, that same news that would have saved them will now condemn them. If I want to be pure of the blood of all men, then I need to be telling all men. I need to be seeking opportunities to share the gospel with people with whom I'm able to speak. And so do you. You need to be busy. I need to be busy. And there's not one of us in this room, I would say, myself included. I loop me in too. There's not one of us who couldn't stand to improve in this area of sharing the gospel. <clears throat> but he says, I'm pure of the blood of all men. There's an awful lot of men who I can't, who I can't talk to. The Yules just got to Nepal. I'm not in Nepal. There's, there's an awful lot of people on planet Earth. How can I be pure of their blood? Well, I can pray that God would send some. The Bible says, pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. So I'm praying for the Lord of the harvest to send laborers. I'm praying for those laborers as they go. In some cases, I'm giving to help support those laborers as they go. But, you know... The height of hypocrisy is supporting a missionary to do on the other side of the world what we won't do here. <laughs> right? You know, if, if the Yules said, well, we, we're here. No, they're there now. They're just getting settled in. They're learning the language. They're very limited right now. But let's say in eight years they send us a, they send us a prayer letter and they say, we, we hand out gospel tracts periodically. And occasionally we tell people about the Lord. What would we say of them as missionaries? That's not really what you're supposed to be doing. We sent you there to do that all the time. Why would God leave you here after he saved you? To do this. I give. I pray. To get the gospel to those who I'm never going to cross paths with. But you know the other truth of that is that each one of us has a unique audience. I cross paths with people every week who you don't. And you cross paths with people every week who I don't. We, we have unique circles in which we run. And the people who you have an opportunity to talk to, if I walked up to them and I tried to get into the gospel with them, they would say, I don't know this guy. But if you did, they'd say, oh, so-and-so. Yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's talk for a minute. Now, they might not let, give you a chance to give them all of it and call them to a, an invitation to trust Christ, but you have unique opportunities, as do I, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's the only way that we can be pure of the blood of all men, is if we take those opportunities, if we speak up. So let's look at our facts one more time. Our universal truths. Death is certain. The universal statistic. All will die. As in Adam, all die. 
even so in Christ shall all be made alive. All men are looking for God. They don't know it. They're just trying to fill that void. They're trying to fill that empty spot. Nothing works. You know it. I know it. And if they would pause long enough, they would know it. Nothing fills that void except a relationship with Christ. All men come to God the same way. There's no, there's no unique formula for this individual that's different from this individual. You can give the gospel to all men. It's applicable to all men because God desires all men to be saved. He's long-suffering to us who are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And my goal should be to be pure of the blood of all men by being a faithful proclaimer of the gospel at all times and in all places. It's going to vary. It's going to look different. In all, of these, in all of these scenarios. You have scenarios where you don't have time to give the whole gospel to somebody. So you give, you give some of it with the anticipation, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to seek an opportunity to talk with that person again. I'm going to give this person a track. We have tracks out in the track rack. They're there for a reason. They're there to give out. Because why? Because all men will die. All men are looking for God. All men come to God the same way. God wants all men to be saved, so we need to get the gospel to all men. Somebody loved you enough to share the gospel with you. However long ago that was, for me it was my mom. She loved me enough to share the good news of what Jesus Christ can do. And I trusted the Lord at a very young age. I don't know when you trusted the Lord or under what circumstances, but the Bible says in Luke chapter 12, verse 48, For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. For to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. As a church, as, as the family of God, as the body of Christ, we've been given much, haven't we? We live in a free country. I don't know how many copies of God's Word I possess in my home. I have the perfect religious liberty to share God's Word with whoever I come in contact with. So what's my excuse? Let's be pure of the blood of all men. Like I said, a different Sunday school lesson, building a case. If all of these are true, and they are because we gave Bible, if all of these are true, then you and I need to be busy. The Bible tells us that the Lord Jesus is coming back. We live in the last days. Paul said he lived in the last days. If Paul lived in the last days 2,000 years ago, then what do we live in? We live in the last of the last days. If it's a clock that's chiming midnight, I would say the chime's already started. We need to get busy for God. We need to be faithfully witnessing as we have opportunity here in this place. But you only spend a, a handful of hours here at church. What about when you go out tomorrow, this afternoon? Be pure of the blood of all men. Share the gospel with whoever you come in contact with. Seek opportunities. In the instance when Jesus was going through Samaria, his disciples said, why, why are we doing this? He said, I must needs go through Samaria. Why? Well, because there was a woman at a well in Sychar who needed to hear about the living water that was offered through Christ. Seek opportunities. Is sharing the gospel ever going to be inconvenient? Should you still do it? Yeah. Yep. Again, if the bridge was out, you wouldn't worry if people thought you were a fanatic because you'd say, the bridge is out, and I have to tell them. Death is certain. Let's, let's get busy. Let's bow for a word of prayer here this morning. Our Father, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you for the grace that's extended to us through Jesus Christ, your Son. Lord, I thank you for the gospel. I thank you that... Someone shared it with me, and I was born again into the family of God. Lord, I pray that I would be faithful. Lord, I pray for these, my brothers and sisters in Christ, that we would be faithful. Here in this place, as we go our separate ways, when the time comes, Lord, I pray that we would go bearing the precious news of the gospel to each and every person with whom we come in contact. I pray that you'd bless. I pray that you'd help us, Lord, to, to maintain these thoughts. Lord, that we would keep the burden that it wouldn't be lost in the noise of our lives and of the day. I pray you bless now as we prepare our hearts for the main service. I pray that you'd speak to us once again out of your word. In 
we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.